so uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thanks all for coming to our uh, session. I know that this is challenging, the, the second day of the conference, the, the afternoon. Uh, maybe our American friends are a bit fresher, uh, but still uh, the good uh, perseverance and endurance. Uh, thank you for all this. And uh, I welcome uh, and I want to introduce our first uh, um, our first uh, presenter in that uh, session uh, and our keynote speaker, Professor Michael Gardiner from Western Ontario University from Canada. And uh, Professor Gardiner uh, is a sociologist uh, and uh, he researched uh, everydayness, the political economy of affective life, uh, the utopianism, and uh, he authored several books and uh, numerous journal articles, including uh, some on boredom, which is which is uh, highly important for us here, uh, like uh, weak messianism, essays in everyday utopianism, and boredom reader. He edited it uh, with uh, Julian Jason Harden, and I suppose this is our our benchmark for for our society, uh, the boredom studies. Uh, reader. Uh, so the, the title of the presentation will be Make the whole scene great again, or why is climate change boring? Uh, yeah, and this uh, topic sounds uh, nothing but boring. So uh, without further uh, ado, uh, I give you the, the floor. Thank you, Marius, uh, and thanks to you and Josefa for giving me the chance to speak today uh, and for organizing the conference. It's a huge commitment, and I know you put so much time and effort into it, and we all recognize that and appreciate it very much. Uh, I feel I do have to apologize to you, though, for a couple of things. Uh, as you know, I've read your PhD dissertation, and I know you have very strong feelings about people reading talks, um, but I'm going to have at least a text I'm going to refer to. Uh, it's not necessarily that PowerPoint corrupts absolutely, but it's something I'm used to. Uh, the good news is it's a relatively short talk. I've timed it about 30, 35, 36 minutes, so we should have plenty of time for discussion, and I'm hoping to get feedback from people because uh, it, it's a work in progress, you know, to use that phrase. And, um, and the other thing I want to apologize for is I'm going to use boredom in a pretty, uh, pretty colloquial way, a pretty loose way, and I know Marius is a stickler for precision, and this will irritate him to no end. Um, but I'm really trying to fathom why the climate issue is boring in the popular mindset rather than develop a sophisticated theory of boredom which i've you know in a way tried to do in other uh, publications so anyway i'll turn right to it uh, as nuclear winter turns to ever hotter summers it's worth asking why is climate change a boring topic for so many people after all in a phrase beloved by climate activists and a few hypocritical politicians global warming represents a so-called existential threat to our species and indeed the integrity of our entire planet very ecosystem. If we take this uh, danger at face value, as pretty much every qualified climate scientist does, it should constitute a clarion call for governments, uh, industry, and the general population to transition quickly to a post-carbon world. And yet, an underlying ennui widely persists. And not just amongst those who typically skew conservative on the political spectrum with regard to such issues, but also, you know, well-informed, well-meaning individuals with an otherwise impeccably, you know, progressive uh, set of credentials. Now, a quick Google search reveals, although I would be remiss if I didn't point out that each Google search generates 0.2 grams of uh, carbon dioxide, which multiplied by 3.5 billion searches every day adds up to quite a lot. Anyway, the conflation in Google searches uh, of climate change with words like boring or boredom is a commonplace thing. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, in the mid 2000, well, 2015, uh, under the byline Melting Glacier, <coughs> Yawn, Guardian staff writer Owen Jones files global warming under the worthy but dull column. Similarly, in a, a Der Spiegel interview around the same time, filmmaker Randy Olson berates climate scientists for framing the issue in putatively boring statistical terms that fails to offer us a broadly compelling narrative. Now, the point is these are not climate skeptics by any stretch. Uh, Jones is probably the most you know, prominent left standard bearer in The Guardian today. Olson is a trained scientist. He worked as an environmental researcher, you know, and both regard climate change as a profoundly important issue that needs to be addressed urgently. 
but it, it seemingly remains a remote and abstract concern. It seems extremely technical, perhaps overwhelming in its complexity. And I think this is not helped by a climate movement that is reflexively prone to a doubtless earnest, but often dour sanctimoniousness and finger wagging moralism. You know, pretty boring stuff to a lot of people. So what I want to do in this talk today is delve uh, deeper into this paradox, you know, an existential threat that, although or because the hobby horse of science dweebs and tree huggers the world over, is as dull as proverbial disrotter to many. Anyway, I'm going to organize my thoughts around the following lines. Uh, first, I think we have to, to confront climate change's ontological status as what humanity scholar Timothy Morton calls hyperobjects. Hyperobjects. Hyperobjects are phenomena extending across vast immensities of time and space. In this context, Morton mentions things like evolution, the biosphere, of course, climate. We could add the internet, which is this inevitable, inevitable thing we all use but really don't understand, and so on. In response to the hyperobject, one person's awestruck sublimity might be another's barely stifled yawn. So that's the first topic. The second and obviously related theme, I think, is that of climate apocalypse. And I think this typically attaches itself to discussions of global warming, uh, especially when eco-modernist prophecies of a good or even great Anthropocene seem remote or downright absurd. Endless reiterations of our dystopian future evince a monotonous similarity that eventually reaches a point, I think, symptomatically of things like psychic exhaustion, resignation, melancholia. The final area of inquiry will concern more socio-political themes. That is, how can we sustain social mobilization uh, as regards the climate issue in an era in which our attention and our communicative exchanges are captured or sequestered at algorithmically in the service of so-called platform capitalism? That is to say, how does one speak truth to power about global warming when post-truth is rapidly becoming the only valid social currency? And crucial issues like climate change are overwhelmed by the sheer noise generated by ubiquitous information overload. And then I have a short conclusion. Well, actually, it's not that short. And I'm going to focus on some of the ways in which uh, climate boredom might be addressed um, and overcome, because obviously it's an important, indeed, existential issue. So climate is hyper object. Um, we're all doubtless familiar with images like rising sea levels, threatening coastal cities, starving polar bears abandoned on ice flows, megastorms, firestorms, and so on and so forth. It's worth stressing, however, that the popular fixation on so-called climate spectacle, we could call it eco-porn if you like, often compromises our awareness of wider interlocking crises that threatens the very bio biophysical stability of our planet. And by the way, just as an aside, this is one reason why I decided not to upload or, or show spectacular images of climate disaster because you could argue that it reinforces a kind of detached God's eye view of things, which to some extent has gotten us into the present uh, mess. Anyway, this catastrophe <laughs> includes such things as, you know, habitat destruction, soil depletion, des desertification, mass extinction, ocean acidification, the interruption of the nitrogen cycle, and so on and so forth. Um, often these are described in terms of tipping points. Causal feedback loops that amplify entropic decline in ways that are non-linear, mutually reinforcing, and wildly unpredictable. So in other words, we're seeing an exponential increase in the overarching complexity and random perturbations of planetary-wide systems. And I think this neatly exemplifies Morton's idea of the hyperobject. Now, the hyperobject is a phenomenon that lacks clearly delineated properties. It exists in a nebulous realm that can't be fathomed directly by things like human observation, intelligence, or imagination. So it's, it's a fundamentally opaque thing. And this opacity occurs because of what Morton calls a transcendental gap existing between the hyper object and any information or data that we can accumulate and interpret about it. So it has a kind of spatiotemporal spatio -temporal inchoateness. And this defies you know, notions of what, idea, what things themselves are. You know, philosophy, uh, natural science has dedicated itself to defining what a thing is, understanding what things are, and the hyperobject defies you know, that very concept. But to focus specifically on the climate issue, Morton argues that because there's no longer any base horizon on which our thoughts, perceptions, actions, and so on can be reliably premised, the world we have come to know and inhabit over the course of the Holocene 
seen the last 80,000 years or so is, and this is the key point, is already dead, right? This world is dead. The world we're familiar with, the world on which we premise our thoughts, actions, norms, and so forth is, is over. Indeed, language itself starts to bleed referential sense. The word permafrost no longer has any meaning, right? Because what is a permanent frost is now melted, releasing uh, methane into the atmosphere, which is a <laughs> greenhouse gas, much worse than carbon dioxide, and so on. Now, there are a lot of ironies here. Uh, the one I like the most is that rising CO2 levels significantly degrades human cognitive capacity. And I think this is important because if we're too um, stupid to address things like climate change now, what's going to happen in successive decades when this collective mental decline you know, really bites? And we've talked a bit about uh, you know, the dementia epidemic and so on and so forth. Um, I think this, <laughs> this puts that uh, kind of um, that makes that in a way trivial because there's this humongous uh, threat um, facing all of our cognitive skills as a, as a species in the very near future because of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Anyway, <clears throat> what does it mean to say that our carbon output right now, at this moment, right, ha will have consequential effects on the global climate for the next 100,000 years? What does it mean to say that? A lot of people will go, I don't know. I'll just shrug the shoulders because it's not a meaningful question in human terms by reference to our usual analogies, perceptions, and metrics. And because of this, it can be seen as fundamentally boring. There are more interesting things to do than you know contemplate these sorts of questions, like you know watching cat videos on YouTube. And I don't mean this facetiously. Uh, Morton repeatedly underscores the point that we can think long and hard about hyperobjects but it doesn't necessarily bring any clarity to the proceedings. So it's not a matter of education or diligence or intelligence. It's a different kind of phenomenon. You know, we in the social sciences and humanities kid ourselves that we can deploy a hermeneutics of suspicion to peel back the layers of a phenomenon to find the, the meaningful essence inside. Again, we kid ourselves we can do that. We like to think we can. Um, but this is fundamentally irrelevant when it comes to hyperobjects. All we can do, according to Morton, is partly and indirectly intuit what he calls scattered fragments and figments of doom. So, you know, I think contemplating this generates uh, a kind of deep-rooted existential anxiety. To me, it's very similar to searching in ideas of nausea, like this sort of, you know, uh, feeling of um, that the ground is shifting lower feet, that we cannot rely on anything anymore. Um, and this arguably provokes uh, a mutation into boredom. If we understand boredom as a kind of affective and libidinal disengagement, protecting the psyche from the unsettling effects of cognitive overreach and dissonance. And I'm going to adapt the words of cultural theorist Frederick Jameson here. He's talking about this in a different context, uh, different context, but I think it's very appropriate to this one. He says, boredom allows us to pursue the lesser evil of avoiding anxiety. And I'm quoting Jameson directly. Something like a repression, a neurotic denial, a preventative shutting off of affect, which, and here's the key point, reconfirms the vital threat of the object, right? Confirms the vital threat of the object, end of quote. Now, for a lot of people, this is um, a reason to embrace a kind of fatalistic resignation, uh, and that's an understandable response, but it's obviously ultimately a self-defeating one. But it does drive home the point that our reliance uh, on notions of human exceptionalism or modernist hubris, whatever we want to call this, are hopelessly antiquated. Um, they're ill-suited to the prodigious demands that a post-Holocene world imposes on us. All right, so moving on to my next topic, which I've called um, apocalypse boredom. So, you know, we're well-informed people. I think deep down we know that um, climate change is a clear and present danger. You know, recent events like, you know, Scandinavia's boreal forests in winter are going up in smoke. That's never happened before. Uh, in Texas over the winter, they had record snow and cold, knocking out the, the uh, power system and so on. I mean, there's no safe havens. Um, now, according to climate scientist turned activist Michael Mann, he's Canadian actually, the scientific debate is over. I mean, Apart from increasingly marginalized uh, fringe elements, it's basically accepted that massive and rapid changes to the world's climates, climate have anthropogenic or better sociogenic causes. Even the far right has increasingly embraced a kind of eco-ethno-nationalism, 
uh, albeit, albeit in inconsistent and opportunistic ways. So really, the debate has shifted to questions of carbon mitigation or infrastructural adaptation rather than the earlier debates around the reality of climate change or, again, humanly caused climate change itself. The problem, of course, is holding the line on rising temperatures according to the IPCC's, IPCC's recommendation of 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, by 2050 requires, shall we say, a complete dismantling of fossil capitalism over the next few decades, transitioning to a very different kind of post-carbon society. But here I think we're faced with the obduracy of what the late, sadly late, Mark Fisher termed capitalist realism. For Fisher, the domination of neoliberal capitalism since the 1980s has made it virtually impossible to envisage alternatives to the status quo. So we're caught in the horns of a dilemma. I mean, we know things are bad, and then we know they have to change, but we can't really imagine any line of flight out of the present situation. And so we carry on as usual. I mean, we're burdened with a kind of sad wisdom or melancholia, but we, we carry on. And I think this is really captured well in concepts like Peter Sloterdijk, the German philosopher's um, concept of enlightened false consciousness, or Slavov Zizek's uh, fetishistic disavowal, which he stole from Sloterdijk. Anyway, both of them serve to draw our attention to the lived contradiction that we all experience between you know, knowing something and doing something, right? There's a, there's a tension or contradiction there. Now, if capitalist realism fundamentally means a kind of hollowing out of the social imaginary, and a loss of confidence in our collective ability to remake the world. I think this has significant repercussions for our, our discussion of boredom as it relates to climate change. And this is something, you know, people in this conference have been talking about a lot, and I think, I think this dovetails neatly with this. It's, um, this blockage of the will, right, manifests itself in an upsurge of apocalyptic visions as a way to sustain some illusion of comprehensibility. And I think Jameson's viral clip that, and I'm quoting, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, or to be more specific, fossil capitalism, here takes on a literal form, right? So we have this anxiety, <laughs> we have to discharge it. And one way to do that is um, to engage in what Adrian Parr calls displacement activities. And what she means by this is we pursue, you know, a commodified lifestyle, environmentalism, we, you know, dutifully recycle plastics, we buy carbon offset products and so on. And, and what we're really doing is enacting various forms of penitence. Um, obviously, we're at least latently aware that the revolution is not, in fact, but a t-shirt away. And that we know that most recycled plastic ends up in landfill to cause poison groundwater and birth defects and so on. But a la Zizek, we, we do it anyway. And we do it because we tell ourselves Tells that we're, you know, we're doing something meaningful. We're maintaining the false impression that we are helping to preserve some mythically pristine nature out there somewhere. But what's really being undertaken, I think, is the affective labor that's necessary to shore up uh, the boundaries of neoliberal subjecthood and the kind of phantom or ersatz public sphere that it is that is its corollary thereby converting, and I'm quoting Parr here, the collectivist impulse at the core of political action into mere narcissism. And narcissism is another concept that's come up in this conference. So perpetual injunctions to change our life in response to the environmental crisis or contemplate, you know, God forbid, you know, system change, um, they really constitute kind of potential injuries to the narcissistic self. And, and these can't be fended off or parried indefinitely. And so they're deflected or discharged via, again, ineffective uh, and empty rituals of consumption, which are fetishistic and hence ultimately, you know, boring, right? Now, in my conclusion, I'm gonna address the question of whether this ennui induced by greenwashing the climate crisis could be mitigated by a genuinely collectivist approach to the problem. But regardless, I mean, I think there's a dawning realization that, you know, so-called climate, uh, sorry, capitalist climate government, governance is going to fall far short of what's necessary to confront the issue effectively. And that's because so much CO2 has been pumped into the atmosphere over the last 200 years, but more importantly, over the last 30 or 40 years, since in fact the first Seinfeld episode was aired, um, which is staggering to think about, um, that there already is catastrophic effects, whatever transpires. Even if we can meet highly ambitious carbon mitigation targets, there are, there are and will be catastrophic effects. 
And so it's not surprising this situation uh, has encouraged a massive uptick in apocalyptic thinking. Um, I read a lot of so-called sci-fi, climate science fiction, um, TV and film, blog posts, uh, news feeds, Reddit for, you know, and so on and so forth. Now for writer Anne Kaplan, being faced with constant intimations of planetary-wide disaster precip precipitates what she calls pre-traumatic stress disorder, emphasis on pre, as opposed to post-traumatic stress disorder. She also calls it uh, climate trauma. Climate trauma is something that mental health professionals have been tracking for some time, and it's become a significant uh, phenomenon. Now, apocalypticism has a long history um, that I can't go into. But in more recent times, the messianic figure of the Judeo-Christian tradition, which both triggers catastrophe and oversees salvation for the worthy, has taken on a more secular hue. Because, you know, the reality of emerging climate disaster is backed up by decades of hard science. Again, the debate is over. But nevertheless, a narrative of redemption through the proverbial baptism of fire, here literalized, uh, remains intact. You know, the kind of the structure of thinking that accompanies apocalyptic thinking, even if it's grounded in science, is the same sort of structure of feeling. You know. What is curious about this brand of apocalypticism is that it does indeed provide, in Jameson's term and in other um, work of his, he calls it a poor man's cognitive map, a poor man's cognitive map, right? It gives us the means to trace, in some sense, the lineaments of end times, right? We're, we're trying desperately to make sense out of a chaotic and deeply unpredictable near future, not distant future, near future. So much uh, dystopian imagery in film and fiction and so on today uh, disturbs us, not because it's remote or, or defamiliarizing, but because it's really only a slight recalibration of existing realities. Now, I would say the semblance of knowledgeability that apocalyptic thinking seems to generate is actually undermined by the eschatological gesture itself because it demands that we abandon collective human will to an inescapable fate. And Zizek reminds us that a modern apocalypticism both heightens mass anxiety around the prospect of end times and simultaneously dis discharges this unease because it normalizes the very prospect of catastrophe itself. So if we can visualize the catastrophe, right, if we produce big budget Hollywood films about it, we're not really unduly surprised when or if it happens. Indeed, indeed, it can be seen as a rip-roaring business opportunity, right? Uh, as befits the phrase disaster capitalism. An example he gives, I'll give this quickly, is that, you know, melting ice caps, we all know about this, are both symptom and cause of uncontrollable climate breakdown. But hey, presto, it's a business opportunity because it opens up, you know, it opens up the polar regions to ever more rampant forms of extractivism vis-a-vis -vis oil and gas reserves that can only intensify this uh, crisis. There are all these dialectical, um, movements built into this, which is why Trump is interested in buying Greenland, by the way. Um, in post-apocalyptic novels and films, and they all depressingly resemble each other, Zizek also notes, and I find this really interesting, he also notes there's a sense of relief, right? In a post-apocalyptic scenario, there's a sense of relief. Although whatever vestiges of society that hang on post-event must cope with difficult primitive conditions, in a sense, humanity's ethical balance sheet has been wiped clean. The sins of our modern technological civilization have been expiated. So to, to paraphrase French philosopher Jean Baudrillard, if the apocalypse is overrated, in part, that's because it's tedious and moralistic. So the point is, the eschaton no longer shocks by its very unknowability. Rather, the reigning ideology is that it can be managed through existing mechanisms of government, of governance, and therefore banalize. It's an everyday thing. We can manage the climate crisis through you know, technological means. When, of course, it should prompt us to entertain transformative possibilities to the auspices of collective political action. And this is how the weak messianism of thinkers like Walter Benjamin envisaged the deployment of a redemptive hermeneutic. So my third area <coughs> of inquiry here is um is about is about um social media uh and i'm not a media theorist but increasingly i read more and more of it and i think um you know when we talk about things like attention and how it relates to boredom and so on i think we have to think about how it's mediated through these technological apparatuses which are are now ubiquitous anyway in an era of post nature we live in a post natural world most of us have uh, access to climate issues through um virtual engagement with social media 
Participation here involves the mediation of what Nick Cernicek calls platform capitalism. Platform capitalism is a new business model consolidated after 2008, the financial crisis. It's designed essentially to monetize the vast amounts of raw data the internet generates. So these platforms insinuate themselves between different stakeholders, us as users, advertisers, suppliers, and so on. It, it sutures us all together in these vast digital networks of obviously that we're accessing right now. By constantly bolstering their de facto monopolistic status, Facebook or Uber make themselves you know, indispensable in our 21st century lives. And, and, you know, we, we get some use value out of this. You know, we get to communicate with friends and family. Uh, we get a cheap ride to work, you know, apparently cheap. Um, but there are also negative aspects, the exploitation of unpaid digital labor, our labor, the convergence of online monitoring, profiteering, surveillance, capitalism, and so on. These are all, these are all extraneous issues. But I want to focus on, what I want to focus on here is how the situation affects our apprehension of the climate crisis uh, and the inherent tendency of platform capitalism to make it essentially boring. And I think there's a dual issue here. The first is that communicative content is filtered through social media, no matter how well informed or critical of the status quo this content is, is everywhere, and this is the key point, everywhere reduced to the abstract equivalence of commodifiable data. And it, I refer to a book by uh, Brown Boucher, a South African um, writer. He wrote a book called The Truth of Nature. And he says, what this means is that conventional notions of truth no longer have any suasive or, or empirical force. Because from the platform's point of view, it only cares whether it can sell aggregate data you know, to interested parties. It doesn't care about the truth, the truth content of any claims, but whether it can sell it and monetize it. So as news as commodity culture generates a kind of epistemological sameness in relation to which all truth claims are reduced to mere opinionizing, post-truth, and this is, this is key to Bush's argument, post-truth is now the very form informational power it takes in our digital era, right? When everything matters the same, you know, from the shade of Beyonce's lipstick to planetary disaster, nothing much matters at all. And there's a kind of meta boredom here. But there's a second aspect, um, because in a world where multiple such platforms compete clamorously for the attention of increasingly diversified and fragmented audiences, there's a very real danger that participants, however, again, motivated by good intentions, are subject to, and we talked about this too, information and affective overload. Right? We can't convert this morass, this, this a lot of information, into accurate, critical uh, knowledge that, that can motivate us. Um, in terms of the climate crisis, Boucher calls this, and I think it's a useful term, digital nature glut. Uh, for example, he talks about the fact that uh, climate, climate advocacy organizations find they have to gamify online campaigns simply to divert fragmented and disperse popular attention towards environmental issues which end up greatly diluting and trivializing the matter at hand. And although semiotic excess is a well-documented feature of media-saturated societies generally, resulting in, and I'm quoting somebody here, uh, overstimulation, numbness, distraction, shortened attention span, indifference leading to inaction, all the things we've been talking about. The overwhelming prevalence of nature glut can help precipitate enervating boredom as regard the climate issue. So I have some concluding remarks. Um, and I'm gonna start with a quote from Niels Burbant. He says, if modernity, if modernity dreamed of the future, the Anthropocene dreams of the present is seen from the future. A perspectival, a perspectival shift that makes our necropolitics apparent to ourselves in the starkest of lights. And I think it's a provocative quote. And I'll put it in different terms. The enlightenment conceit of the forward march of linear progress has been replaced by an awareness that we may well have inadvertently engineered our own demise. By locking us into a future determined, largely determined by our past and present actions. Now it's worth pointing out the Anthropocene itself is a hotly disputed term um, because it can be taken to imply that our, our seeming penchant for necropolitics, the politics of death, our own death, uh, is traceable to some metaphysical flaw in the human as such. Others, like myself, prefer, prefer to point fingers at things like fossil capitalism um, and the genocidal colonialism, extractivism, patriarchalism, and so on that necessarily accompany it, as well as the absurdly high levels of uh, wasteful consumption and so-called carbon addiction associated with certain leisure classes uh, in the global north, that is to say, mostly us. <laughs> 
To paraphrase Max Horkheimer, those who are silent about capitalism should probably shut up about climate change. Now, what's interesting here to me is that although you know, I'm loath to dispense with class analysis or ignore the history of colonialism and so on, I think there are certain developments inherent in Burbank's perspectival shift that at least gesture towards a species level set of overlapping interests. And for Canadian, Canadian philosopher Todd Dufresne, I think that's how you say it, one of the many ironies of the Anthropocene, if we want to stick to that term, is that it also implies a time of anthropo anthropocenity. What he means by this is a kind of post-posthumanism. Now, obviously, in facing this potentially catastrophic future, we're, we're not all going to suffer in the same way. But in, a, in another overarching sense, we do share a common fate, because ultimately, the things like the mountain redoubts and fortified islands of Silicon Valley billionaires will not save them, even them, in the end. In a strange way, this represents the realization of Hegel's universal history, albeit in the form of what Dufresne calls the democracy of suffering, democracy of suffering. Whether the suffering binds us together in a kind of negative community or not, uh, if we can go beyond our current necropolitics to embrace the politics of life, of shared joy and vitality and mutual aid, then we might have a less boring time ahead of us. Because a wholly foreclosed future is ipso facto boring, right? So I have three, I have three points I want to talk about here. Um, again, as I've argued, as other people in this conference have argued, to a consider, considerable extent, the boredom of modern mass societies represents a blocked capacity to make this world a meaningful, meaningfully habitable place. Here, systemic marginalization feeds annoying anxiety that can eventually take the form of pervasive boredom as a defense mechanism. This is, this is familiar territory to us. But what's interesting to me anyway is that the hyper object of climate change presents us with a phenomenon so ineffable, so vast, that it threatens to intensify this anxiety boredom dialectic exponentially. Because understanding this thing much less steering it, um, seems beyond human powers of uh, comprehension and agency. The dawning of the post-Holocene forces an awareness that human history is now hopelessly entangled with geohistory, right? Human history is part of geohistory and vice versa. And there's no going back. There's no going back to some presumptively safer, more predictable shore. So I think our present circumstances draw us towards a kind of defining tension. because. You know, a lot of scholars and thinkers would say that, that climate change implies we are not an exceptional species. We are not separate from the so-called natural world. We're parts of vast assemblages consisting of technical systems, immense flows of matter and energy, and myriad biophysical cycles. And this implies a radical rethink of our, our nature, our powers, our capacities. A lot of people call this post-humanism with respect to our overarching pluriverse. Um, Cultural theorist Donna Haraway says, we have to embrace an egalitarian interspecies muddle, an interspecies muddle. Now, I think these are, um, these are really seductive and attractive ideas. But I also think we're in danger of throwing the baby out. Uh, we're th in danger of throwing out the baby of any conceivable political solution to the climate crisis with the bathwater of a necessary species humility. And this I subscribe to uh, the work of writer, the Swedish writer and climate activist Andres Malm, his argument that a full-blown hum post-humanism ultimately encourages a kind of fatalistic renaturalization of climate change. Right? Now, it may well be the case that ethical self-flagellation over human culpability and kickstarting the Anthropocene is, I'm quoting uh, a, a person called Alamo, Stacey Alamo, uh, is coded with a veneer of species pride. Yet arguably, meditations on becoming, on the interconnectedness of all things, a lot of people kind of turn to Eastern philosophy for this. However much these things might challenge ordinary narcissism, self-absorption, thoughtlessness, they cannot in and of themselves exceed the gravitational force of capital and the threat of our oblivion. For someone like French sociologist Bruno Latour, politics is something we co-create with nature. Humans are only part of many actors in this pluriverse. But Malm believes that politics relates exclusively to humankind's capacity for action-based reflection and intersubjective deliberation. And here, the comportment of things like glaciers or viruses, we know all about viruses now, 
They certainly affect outcomes in certain ways. Uh, they help to generate distinctive enabling conditions, right? But they don't exhibit anything like intentionality or agency. On which effective resistance to fossil capitalism must be premised? And the point is not to introduce a new kind of uh, human nature divide, but for Mom to argue that um, certain emergent properties are inherent to human societies which are capable of new configurations in light of changing conditions. I'll quote Mom, brief, Mom briefly. He says, the fact that humans act within the carbon cycle and other natural forces does not in any way diminish our agency, it amplifies it." End of quote. In other words, posthumanism's timing is awful. <laughs> it proclaims the end of human centrality just as we as a species are developing in generalized awareness that our activity, our purpose of activity, has dramatically altered the world's biophysical systems. At the same time, we want to avoid the kind of hubris that would indulge in such techno-capitalist fantasies as, for example, turning vast solar geoengineering operations over to some benign artificial intelligence control, which is something that is seriously muted, mooted, uh, which is arguably another kind of fatalistic defeatism. Now, broadly rejecting these sort of geoengineering schemes, Mao plumps instead for deep and immediate reductions in carbon emissions which again requires confronting the institutionalized power of fossil capital and dismantling its vast infrastructure by force if necessary. So he's not one for pulling punches. Mal is dismissive, not only of capitalist greenwashing solutions for obvious reasons, but also so social democratic reformism, too little too late, or anarchistic notions of horizontalism and so on, um, noble but ineffective. Endorsing instead what he calls climate Bolshevism. Uh, he's a prolific guy, he's written a few books in the last year or two. He wrote one on the coronavirus uh, crisis, linking it to climate change. It's called Corona Climate Chronic Emergency. Malm in this book draws extensive parallels between the world's response to COVID-19 and the climate emergency. He argues that if metaphors of war that our politicians frequently evoked uh, in tackling the former, the pandemic, they are doubly appropriate for the climate issue. Now, the notion of waging war on climate change is hardly original to Mao. It crops up a lot. Um, but in his case, he's not indulging in displaced militarism or machismo for its own sake. That's because he's not evoking, for example, the Allied struggle against the Axis powers uh, or even metaphors like uh, President Johnson's uh, war on poverty in the 60s. But rather, he's evoking the war communism period in the early Soviet period, uh, 1918 to 21. Now, facing immense challenges, you know, to defeat um, Western intervention, count white counter-revolution, to socialize industry and agriculture to meet basic um, population needs, to keep the Red Army supplied and fed, the odds for the Bolsheviks were extremely long, but they won, right? For Malm, war communism provides the template for a just war of both human liberation and ecological sanity, right? That's the key, both human liberation and ecological sanity that provides us with the overarching cause, necessary motivation, and inherent meaningfulness, right, these terms we've been talking about, in the struggle required for mass mobilization against, in this case, the existential threat of climate change uh, breakdown. Now, if mass boredom and the paralysis of the affective response that follows is at least partly the result of the blockage of humanity's will and agency, something like Malm's call to arms might help mitigate its more deleterious effects. So I got a couple of other points, I'll try and move through them quickly. Um, if we're gonna save the world from climate Armageddon just to preserve <laughs> capitalist realism, uh, that's a singularly boring prospect for me anyway. Um, and so we need to construct a more compelling narrative of what kind of world we wanna see in the future or near future. Um, I think there, for example, there are different ways to think about climate apocalypse that are more palatable, arguably less boring than I discussed above. And I'll briefly evoke uh, writer called Lisa Garforth, uh, she says, apocalyptic rhetoric can be repurposed so as to open up the utopian imaginary to different post holocene alternatives. But only if we envisage apocalypse not as uh, putative end times, as some kind of singular rupture that normalizes the status quo in some moment of cathartic resolution, but on a meditation, as a meditation on how to exist together in an era of ongoing crisis, precarity, turmoil. Brilliant writer Anna Singh calls this poetically living after the end of the world. 
What this means is that we have to grasp the, the climate apocalypse as something that is imminent, that is to say already unfolding, it's here and now, rather than imminent in the sense of a future event. And that confirms multi-temporal trajectories to, towards any number of possible futures, right? The idea is to keep open a number of possible futures rather than shut everything down and resign ourselves to the climate apocalypse, right? One could say a lot here, obviously, uh, I'll focus briefly on the question of austerity and quality of life. Um, basic idea here is just because we're facing peak everything doesn't necessarily mean grinding sacrifice and dour asceticism. That's hardly you know, an attractive option, especially after decades of neoliberal austerity. Um, a woman called Kate Co uh, Soper has this idea of um, alternative hedonism, which I think is a, strikes a welcome chord. For Soper, you know, the consumerism today, extreme time poverty, environmental devastation, social atomization, all of these that are needed to sustain our, our you know, way of life uh, and all of them lead to boredom, you know, creates alternatively burned out and bored individuals. But we can still cultivate modalities of pleasure and enjoyment and social conviviality. I'll turn this off the news here is communal luxury rather than single-minded privatized acquisitiveness. And I think an important element of this is a politics of care, a politics of care that attends to people, objects, and the natural world with all the attentiveness, concern, and respect they, they ultimately deserve, which I think is necessary to maintain uh, and enrich a shared commons. According to the French philosopher Bernard Stiegler, thinking itself is properly understood a form of care. Thinking is a form of care, something that cannot, cannot even be approximated by the operations of computational capitalism. Reversing the entropic decline fostered by the capitalocene, another useful term, must involve the deployment of a therapeutic form of attunement to the world, one that turns away from the blocked horizon, as Stigler's term, marking the present day towards negentropy, negative entropy, by which he means enhanced ecosystemic complexity, difference, and inter and intra species vitality. Last quick point. Maybe, maybe we should lighten up. Because Remember, the apocalypse is overrated. And here I think the work of Nicole Seymour is instructive. If the default position of climate, of climate activists tends to be gloom and doom and more than a degree of self-righteousness, all of which can become boring very quickly, uh, environmentalism can be made more attractive by injecting it with a dose of self-depreciating humor, irony, and even odd gestures towards seemingly frivolous camp, collectively what Seymour calls bad affects, or queer affects. These affects, these affects are ambivalent, and necessarily so, because the post-Holocene future that awaits us is obviously unclear and ambiguous at best. For Seymour, we should embrace the rage, grief, shame pole that is often seen in discussions around climate trauma, but also that, is, but also that of subversive humor, and the many ironies uh, involved in, say, middle-class professionals preaching environmental uh, abstinence. Such bad affects can extend the relational and the social to the realm of ecological questions and show us a way forward that avoids the respective dead ends of, and I'm quoting a Seymour, crippling cynicism and stultifying optimism, end of quote. Especially the stultifying optimism, because as Walter Benjamin tells us, even the dead are not safe, because we know the enemy has not ceased to be victorious. And this is as true with regard to the looming war against fossil capital as anything else. And I didn't end on a happy note, but anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Michael, uh, very much. Do we have uh, any questions right now? Okay, we have first hand, please. Right. Here. That, oh, it's working. Great. Lovely. Sorry. Yeah, sorry for not having the camera switched on for, for, for all the previous panels. Uh, thank you, thank you for this presentation, I illuminating as always. And uh, I just wanted to touch briefly on, on your reference, uh, on your reference to, to Mark Fisher, which I think was very interesting. And uh, uh, one thing that still surprises me about capitalist realism when I go back to this book is that when Fisher uh, touches upon a concrete specific political solutions to, to the crisis, to what he calls capitalist realism. He proposes a, this set of very, say, very moderate policies. Um, 
all the ways that we can use to start dealing with this this overwhelming sense of helplessness and boredom and so on uh, can be articulated in very in very accessible terms, so to speak. So we need to rethink the idea of the strike. We need a stronger NHS. We need a return to to the good public television from the 70s and so on. And I think that uh, what this uh, sort of the the analogy between uh, capitalist realism and the way we approach climate crisis ends is that we cannot do the same thing in the context of the climate crisis. There is no sort of reformist program. There is no agenda of local action that would have immediate consequences and alleviate the situation in some way, right? I think this is something that we feel especially strongly in, in uh, let's say, in semi-peripheries in countries such as Poland in the context of the climate crisis or climate emergency, where we have this thing that even in a country that heavily rel relies on coal, such as Poland, even if we had a far-reaching reform of uh, energy sector, for instance, this will th this won't really provide a solution to the global crisis. So there is this feeling that there is a crisis that is happening elsewhere and there aren't any specific political steps that we can take here and now that would maybe in time become the start of, of something else. We need a sort of radicalism like immediately. And I think this also this is also tied closely to to the issue of posthumanism. And I really appreciated your comments on on the bad timing of posthumanist of posthumanist thought. I, I'm going to use this phrase somewhere. So thank you for for that. It's it's a fantastic quote. Uh, but uh, I think that whenever we approach the issue of climate crisis from the from the point of view of a species, we do the same thing. We uh, attribute the crisis to to the human species as a whole. Uh, when a lot of people in the global north, I think rightly, are ready to point out that they're not really guilty nor responsible for the actual crisis. Most people aren't, right? It's, it's not our responsibility. Why are we left to deal with the crisis that is not our own? So this feeling that, in fact, we are, we are in, we're influenced by a crisis that's happening elsewhere or coming from some sort of an external plane. I think this is something that might be one of the sources of this boredom that you that you described and i was wondering whether whether you'd agree with such a diagnosis uh, i guess yeah I, I find myself in complete agreement with what you said i mean I, i'm frustrated with people like mark fisher and i'm trying to remember the guy who wrote um persistence of the negative i mean you have these radical critiques and then they end up saying well we need to go back to the welfare state <laughs> you know we need to resuscitate you know public ownership or whatever and these are kind of it's a failure of the imagination uh, and, and anyway, times run out. I mean, I think social democratic solutions to the climate crisis in particular, and frankly, the pandemic has been not very well handled by, you know, even, you know, uh, most state actors. Uh, it's time for far reaching, much more radical uh, approaches. And I, I like Mom because he, he has, he combines rigorous logic with a kind of, um, um, a kind of, he doesn't, he doesn't mince words. I mean, he's, he's, he tells it like it is, unlike Donald Trump. He really does tell it like it is, and he's embracing this idea of climate Bolshevism, which I find a useful term. I mean, uh, Melm used to be an anarchist. He used to be, uh, you know, an advocate of kind of, you know, temporary autonomous zones and these sorts of things. Uh, but he's come to realize these will be failures when faced with the immensity and scale of the climate crisis and what has to be done. And I don't know whether you read Melm's work, but one of his recent books, and he's written so many, uh, is called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And he's not joking. I mean, he's saying pipelines are actually relatively easy to destroy and we need to attack the fossil fuel infrastructure now and like plug it up. And, you know, this idea of, you know, kind of uh, stopping up the choke points in the global supply chains and so on and so forth. These, these are realistic ideas. And, and Mel has a very, to my mind, convincing argument that this is not terrorism. This is not violence because violence against things is not violence. It's certainly not terrorism, right? Those are things against people, and those are deliberate, you know, to targets of civilian populations or whatever. And you know, I find myself on board with this. And when I, I teach a climate, climate change course, and when I talk about maybe we need to destroy climate, you know, fossil fuel infrastructure, students are you know stunned. But he said, you know, we have to we have to make a step. The example he gave is, uh, you know, I think it was in uh, Stockholm in the 90s. Basically, they went around, uh, they, they were finding SUVs and putting a little stone in the in the uh, in the tire to hold the, the, for the air pressure, and it, it let the, um, the air out of the tire, and then they put a note on the SUV saying, you know, you might want to rethink your lifestyle choices, right? So there was no destruction of property. Uh, it was an inconvenience, 
Uh, but the weird thing is, you know, um, tens of thousands of Swedes got behind this and they really supported this, this campaign of, you know, apparent terrorism or whatever. Um, so it did change a lot of minds and apparently uh, sales of SUVs in Sweden went down like 25 or 30% literally overnight because of this action. So it's a kind of thing which is action against property or things, which is not violence as such, and even a philosophical sense or whatever. But I think, I think it's reaching a point where if you follow the climate crisis issue, uh, it's reaching a point where drastic action is needed. Uh, and so you probably know, you know, the New Deal, um, there are many different scenarios of the New Deal. Um, the more interesting ones are called, you know, People's New Deal, and they, it segues into introducing these reforms so as to open up, you know, radical, radical transformative possibilities rather than, you know, capitalist climate governance or kind of reform capitalism, you know, to main, maintain some kind of control of uh, carbon emissions or whatever. So those are more attractive notions. Uh, I think Mount's pretty clear we need the state apparatus involved in this. Um, and again, I come back to this idea that, you know, war can be boring for sure, but it also provides a kind of collective uh, sense of um, meaning, right? It provides a collective sense of responsibility. And, you know, people do talk and go in terms that, um, you know, war, you know, unites populations around specific issues. Now, mostly they're for bad reasons, um, but I think evoking the idea of war communism is a very interesting notion. It's a different kind of war, right? It's a different kind of war than capitalist war, right? Inter Intercapitalist uh, struggle or whatever. So anyway, I, I don't know whether that addresses your question, but I find myself in pretty much full agreement with what, with what you said. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Do we have uh, another question? Okay, Andreas, but I'm not sure that Michael can hear us. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, you can. Okay. Hi, Michael. Yeah, thanks. thanks so much for a fantastic talk. Um, very insightful and thought provoking. Um, I wonder what you thought about. I mean, I'm interested in. A kind of a moralizing aspect or character of attempts to get people more engaged with um, with activism, and, and I think what I was as you were talking, I was thinking about a difference between our responses to the COVID pandemic versus climate um, threat about um, climate change. And I, I remember listening to radio shows at the beginning of the pandemic and scientists were saying, you know, developing a new kind of vaccine for this kind of virus is a big deal. It might take years. And then it turns out that people, I mean, there's a lot to criticize. Let's not, I'm, I don't, I don't want to go there, but there was some kind of collective enterprise that helped out carrying out finding, researching for the vaccine. You know, there's money to be made, of, of course, by huge pharmaceuticals, so that's very helpful to have it. So I was thinking about why are, why are we bored with this threat, the environmental threat, and no with the COVID threat. And I was thinking if you had any thoughts about maybe this, the moralizing aspect is important, or it's, I don't know how important, but it seems to me that in a lot of conversations when you say, well, you should be doing more about the environment, there's an implicit assignment of blame. Um, and we're resistant to taking a share of that blame. So maybe there's something about a coping mechanism, that apathy or boredom is a way of coping with my moral responsibility. It's just too much to bear. I don't know if that, does that make sense? Is that something that you were thinking or I'm just interested in your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I talked a little bit about the uh, narcissistic self and how, you know, we're constantly uh, being interpolated to, um, you know, be more responsible environmentally to do this and that and so on. It all boils down to kind of individualistic solutions to these things which are ineffectual and again, ritualistic and fundamentally boring. Um, but yeah, I think we, we parry these sort of um, moral disapprovals um, by getting bored about the issue, just you know, shrugging our shoulders and turning away. Um, but on, on the question of COVID, I mean, COVID was interesting in the early, I don't know whether your experience was the same, but here, I mean, there was a sense of collective effort. I mean, people were, you know, holding to guidelines and they were, you know, uh, you know conforming to the lockdown rules. And weirdly, people uh, in this neighborhood started to talk to each other and, you know, say hello for the first time. And people were out walking and there was a sort of sense of like this. And you know, this is quite a busy road, but the traffic was, you know, shut down and people were enjoying walking in the streets. And, and, there, and there was a weird sense of kind of liberation in a way. Now. That didn't last, but I, th I think, you know, connections can be made between that kind of response um, 
you know, and, and the climate crisis. And one of the ways to make the connection is because if you know, you know, and you might know about this, but, um, you know, pandemics and climate crisis are, are linked in all kinds of ways because habitat destruction brings us into contact you know, through zoonotic transfer, you know, to these uh, forms of virus and so on and so forth. Um, also, you know, rising temperatures are going to spread tropical diseases in temperate regions and so on. There, I can go on and on. But the point is, these are not separate issues. They are intimately connected. And so we can make a case that, um, you know, in a way, the pandemic response could be seen as a dress rehearsal for, uh, the climate, for the climate response. And one of the ways, you know, it's a dress rehearsal is, you know, a lot of the kind of <laughs> sacred cows of neoliberalism were thrown out the window, you know, in terms of spending, in terms of, you know, deficit spending, in terms of, you know, um, you know, state provision of, uh, you know, protective gear and so on and so forth, you know. So I don't think there's any, you know, I don't think it's going to be easy to put the genie back in the bottle and go back to that, you know, kind of capitalist realism. I think this is, the, the pandemic has released all kinds of possibilities that I think the powers of be are desperately, you know, trying to contain and put back in the bottle. But it's going to be interesting. I mean, for example, there's a labor shortage, you know. <laughs> people have enjoyed their time off work or working from home. Uh, people don't want to go back to, you know, working three crappy jobs with no benefits, you know, and being shouted at by their horrible boss. Like, so there's a huge labor shortage in the U.S. in particular right now. I think, I think there has been a kind of sea change. Uh, how it's going to play out is, is anyone's guess. But, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people are fundamentally reassessing uh, you know, their, their uh, uh, existence and, you know, how they, how they address these things. So I think, yeah, I think connections can be made. And I, but I think you're right about the... Uh, which is why I got into Seymour's argument. It's a, it's a great book. It's called Bad Environmentalism, and she gets into these ideas around affect and how do we how do we you know kind of get people interested in these issues? And one way to do it is not to wag your finger and moralize, because fundamentally these are hypocritical gestures, right? Middle class people telling working class people they have to consume less or whatever, um, but to do it through through uh, subversion, right? Through humor, through irony, uh, through self depreciation, through camp. You know, these sort of mechanisms she, and she looks at a lot of popular culture and stuff to um put flesh on the bones of these ideas of bad affects but i, I think that's a really valuable i think it's a really valuable way to, to rethink a politics of ecology around not just a kind of you know dour moralism but a, a different way of engaging people so the question is one of urgency and that's what, what i come back to blowing up pipelines is that um you know we don't have a lot of time <laughs> so thanks for your question uh, thank you. Uh, so maybe I have a question because uh, you said at least about two kinds of boredom, like climate boredom and apocalypse boredom. So my question is: uh, Did you mean by all this uh, that uh, we are bored or people are bored with uh, discourse? So there is a, a lot of processing, a lot of the the repetitiveness, uh, uh, like in club informational uh, society boredom. Uh, or there is a real threat that there is no future and uh, there is said that we are bored with all this situation and maybe uh, we can extend this uh, claim that we when we do not perceive that we have future that there is no future in this situation in, in our life and so on so on um. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. I think, uh, again, three things there. The first is the hyperobject itself, just as an entity. is It's easier to be bored about the hyperobject than to kind of engage with it, right? Second thing is uh, one way to respond to this looming crisis is apocalyptic thinking, which I think is fundamentally boring because it's all the same. All dystopias are the same, right? Um, so we have to get a way out of that. And the third is the, um, the way we engage with questions around nature, ecology, are, are filtered through social media and these sorts of platforms, which um, basically destroy the truth content of any engagement with the issue. And so the platform capitalist uh, system itself has to be overcome. And one way to do that is so-called platform socialism. That is to say, you know, socialize these entities, make them public utilities, um, <laughs> make their algorithms public. Um, you know, or at least, you know, break them up and regulate the hell out of them. Um, so we have to deal with platform capitalism as an entity because it has turned informational power into post-truth. And again, I'm not a media theorist, but I, I think, again, when we talk about things like attention and so on and so forth, we have to consider um, these platforms and how they function. So yeah, it's all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing I, one thing I get into, I mean, I wrote a much longer version of this and then I edited it down for the talk. Um, 
But I wanted to talk about um, ecological um, boredom. And what I mean by that is climate change will radically simplify our ecosystems. You know, and an ecosystem that consists of cockroaches and rats, it's a viable ecosystem, but it's, it's pretty boring too. Um, it's what George Monbiot, uh, the English writer, calls uh, ecological boredom. So we have to, I think that's a component of this. I mean, we're facing a radically less complex future, a radically uh, impoverished you know, future from an environmental point of view. Um, and so um, that generates boredom too. Right? Uh, anyway, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, f f thank you very much for uh, for summarizing the the, the point that there that there are two elements here. Okay, uh, and uh, John Eastwood has a question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, if there's still time, I'm I'm not keeping track. Are we good? Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, very wide ranging and 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 lots to chew on here and and. I, I have a, a thought or a question that's maybe overly specific. I don't know if it's something that we can explore, but this idea about a failure of imagination being critical to the predicament in which we find ourselves, maybe both the collective imagination and, and the personal individual imagination um, strikes me as being uh, really helpful and important idea. And, you know, from a psychological perspective, there is a smattering of research to suggest that uh, our, attempt, our, our, our imagination is declining, that there are some standardized tests of imagination that have been used over the years, and we can see scores dropping, uh, all the while that IQ scores are actually rising. This is the Flynn effect, which, which is maybe not really relevant for what I'm getting at here, but I, I just agree that failure of imagination is a problem and I believe that we struggle. And so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts here, not so much about what possible futures we imagine that are less anxiety provoking and where we're more efficacious, not necessarily what we imagine, but ideas you have about how we might educate our imagination, how we might um, collectively and individually uh, foster the capacity to to have an imagination that's efficacious at a moment like this. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent, uh, excellent point. I mean, I think we're seeing an impoverishment of the imagination uh, for all kinds of reasons, which we can't really get into. Um, people's IQ scores are rising because people are getting better at writing IQ tests, <laughs> arguably. Um, but, you know, I think we have to turn back to, uh, you know, the utopian imagination. Uh, this woman I mentioned, Lisa Garforth, that wrote a book called Green Utopias. And um, I think it's a, it's a good resource that we have to tap into the uh, education of desire, as William Morris put it, and uh, rethink utopianism in a very dystopian world and keep alive the sort of utopian visions. And the idea of uh, multiplicity of different futures, I think is hugely important. And, you know, there's no getting away from the apocalypse. That's part one of my points is that we are in the apocalypse right now. We are, it is imminent in what we are doing. Uh, and that that in a sense constrains our future, but it also opens it up to different possibilities too. Uh, you know, future generations, our generation, are going to have to deal with some pretty serious stuff. Um, there's a great book by uh, Wallace Wells called um, The Uninhabitable Earth, which is the best primer on climate change to a general audience. I've seen, and he, he makes a point in the um, preface, you know, he, he has uh, young children and people ask him, are, you're so consumed by a climate issue, why do you have children? And he says, because they will face the greatest they are facing the greatest challenge that humankind has ever faced, right? And, and that's exciting, and that gets back to the, you know, the war communism idea, or in the war against climate change, um, which is more than a metaphor, I think, and it provides, it provides a spark of imagination and a set of possibilities that opens up the utopian horizon to different, to different things, you know? Um, and that's, why I, that's what I want to keep alive. Um, you know, I, th I think the right is, is, uh, has been, have been climate denialists for so long because they do understand that superseding fossil capitalism means a very different kind of society, right? A post-carbon society that is, will have to be an internationalistic, socialistic society if we as a species have any kind of future, you know, when the planet has any kind of future. So, and that's what, they know, they know that, they, they know that intuitively. And that's why they're so opposed to any kind of, you know, reformism or subsidizing, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, renewable resources or whatever. So uh, I, I think, uh, no, we face a very interesting future. I mean, climate change is not boring for me. It is uh, exciting and terrifying in equal measure. Um, anyway, thank you.
Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for all the uh, questions. Uh, and thank you, Professor Gardiner, for, uh, for excellent speech.